Good afternoon. How is everyone doing? I am from Detroit, so no Detroit jokes, please. <laughs> we'll be kind to Detroit. Um, we've looked at a lot of successes this morning, and I think it's time to look at some failures, some complications. I always tell my students, I said, successes make us happy. Our failures keep us real. So we learn from our failures, we don't learn from our successes. So my topic this afternoon is sinus grafting, and I'll discuss some complications, how do we minimize, prevent complications, and if they arise, what are some simple solutions that we can apply in our clinical practice. And all of these are evidence-based, what we have learned over the last few years. So we will talk about very, very briefly, uh, we know the sinus grafting procedure is a very predictable procedure. We've been doing it for over 30 years, but there are some intraoperative complications that we run into, mainly membrane perforation, artery bleeding issues, which we were not even aware of till a few years ago, that this could potentially be a serious problem. We identify this much better today. Um, we look at implant displacement. What happens when the implant travels into the sinus cavity? How can we avoid it? And if we cannot, how can we retrieve it? Then we look at some post-operative complications, some simple solutions. For example, for over 10 years, we were using the wrong antibiotics when it came to sinus infections. The bacteria in the mouth are very different than bacteria in the sinuses. We will look at one or two cases of oroantral communication, how we repair it today. And I'd like to share with you some of the research that we've done um, in my practice on how do we manage sinuses when you don't have a sinus lining, or you have a very thin, fragile lining that just tears, and you cannot contain the bone graft. We have some options. Now, when we look at success rate of implants in grafted sinuses, we see it's in the 90 to 95 percent range. We've known this. But we also realize that any time you have a membrane perforation or your sinus graft gets infected, our success rate or survival rate of implants drops to below 90 percent. So today, as we are trying to achieve close to 100 percent success, uh, we want to minimize these complications. When we look at some recent studies, uh, they looked at, this is this year, looked at 200 consecutive procedures, our membrane perforation rate was about 26%. Another study uh, found that the membrane perforation or the Schneiderian membrane tearing was close to 40%. So it's kind of in the ballpark that we've known in the last decade or so that it's about 20 to 50% is the incidence of membrane perforation. Now, there was also a positive correlation between membrane perforation and, obviously, sinusitis and secondary infection. So we know that this affects the overall survival rate of our implants. What can we do to avoid it? And then if we cannot, how do we fix it? For example, the number one cause, well, I should say number two, because you know, today we use piezos, so it's very safe, but when we used to use round burrs, diamonds to open up our window, is when we used to ca cause a lot of membrane tears. Today, that's not an issue, but a very common issue that we see is about one-third of our patients have a septum. Now, this septum, could be complete, as you can see in this patient, or a lot of times this septum is incomplete. That's the problem is when you have an incomplete septum and most of these sinus membranes are very thin, is when you're trying to lift this membrane is you end up tearing the membrane. A simple solution. We played around with a few different possibilities and we found what works really best is actually your collagen wound dressing, collatape. You dip the collatape in sterile water or saline, you put that first on your membrane, and your instrument pushes against that. That 
because it absorbs a lot of liquid, a lot of water, uh, it will in itself help release that membrane from the septum. And plus you have an added layer of security where you can lift this membrane, you can add some bone graft, and you're pretty much done with the procedure. A simple solution uh, that probably took us a few years to realize how could we overcome reflecting a membrane on the septum. Now what happens when you have a frank perforation, a big tear? This is something we've been doing routinely. It's pretty straightforward. You take a collagen membrane. You want to make sure your collagen membrane at least takes four to six weeks to resorb. You place that, and then it's business as usual. You can graft, and you can place your implant. So I won't spend too much time on membrane uh, uh, perforation management, because this is something that's been published, and there's a lot out there. So this is fairly routine. Now, the important part to remember is, why are we doing this? We are doing this to create a false ceiling so that our bone graft does not migrate and end up into the ostium. The ostium drains into the highest part of the middle meatus, right? And the only reason we've been lucky so far and we've been able to get away with a lot of small perforations is that about one-fourth of our patients have accessory maxillary ostium. So that's why even if there's a little pieces of bone graft that travel, because the body is trying to get rid of this. The body thinks that this bone graft particle is allergen particle. It's trying to get rid of this. And the only way to get rid is through the ostium. So small particles is not a problem. But when you have a large amount of bone graft, that could potentially block the ostium. The ostium is also the point of entry for our ENT surgeons. They put a scope in. They go in through the ostium um, to do any kind of sinus surgery. So it's very, very critical. Today with cone beam CT, we realize that if the ostium is blocked, then we need to put our patient on prednisone, some steroids, antihistamine decongestants to make sure it's nice and patent, it's open. But more importantly, when we have a membrane perforation, we don't want that bone graft getting into the ostium. What happens when the ostium gets blocked? Well, you could have a simple infection. These are easy to treat. If you're getting a green discharge, and if your patient, by the way, clindamycin or amoxicillin does not do anything for the bacteria in the sinuses. Uh, you have to give them augmentin. It's got clavulinic acid. Or if they're already on augmentin and you have infection, you put them on Avalox. It's moxifloxacin. Uh, it's 400 milligrams once a day. So that should resolve this issue. But a more serious issue, and there's very little published on this, is what happens if there's blockage of the ostium? First symptom, your patient will complain of more pain and pressure three to five days after your sinus surgery. That's a dead giveaway. We've seen a lot of patients, so please be astute. Uh, that any time I think there was a big perforation and I put a large volume of graft in, I'm calling my patient uh, at about three to five days and see how they're doing. If they are, their symptoms are getting worse, if they are having a lot of that pressure, we treat them besides antibiotics, we put them on prednisone 20 milligrams twice a day. This is a life-saving drug. And if their symptoms do not improve within 24 to 48 hours, you need to send them to an ENT surgeon. All they need to do is put a scope through the nose and clean out that ostium. Because we all drive, but we are trying to be a safe driver to prevent that one fatal accident, right? That's what things can go really south, and this is what we don't want to happen. Uh, this patient, because infection from the maxillary sinus will go into the sphenoid sinus, and then into the cavernous sinus. Uh, this patient, unfortunately, this is a published case, uh, died after severe infection. This is a drain that was put into the cavernous sinus. So this is that one fatal accident that we are trying to avoid. Let's look at a second intraoperative complication, which is bleeding. Now, it wasn't 
till the mid-2000, when we started looking at cone beam CT, that we realized something, that you know what? There is a branch of the maxillary artery, another posterior superior alveolar artery that runs in the lateral wall of the sinus, and we could run into some bleeding issues. For example, till a few years ago, we were not even looking at this. Today, this is the first thing that we look at when we reflect a flap to see, can we spot that artery? Today, with cone beam CT, we have a lot of this information already. Now this, as I mentioned, is a branch of the maxillary artery, which is a branch of our external carotid artery. So this is a major vessel here. And what we've known in the last few years is that 100% of the time, this artery then traverses superiorly and anastomoses with the infraorbital artery. A portion of this artery is always within the lateral wall of the canal. And sometimes, based on how much resorption you have, this could be pretty close to the crest of the bone, exactly where we draw our window. And what's scary is that some of these, as you'll see, could be pretty large in diameter. So knowledge is powerful. I always tell my students, the fact that we know about this, we are looking for it. For example, this is a recent case. Now, this is very interesting because this is going to be the only published case in the dental literature of an artery being spotted in a periapical x-ray. And you know what the, the crazy thing is? We went back and we looked at 100 periapical x-rays and we found the artery in 30 of them. So, so far, we thought that you could detect this artery only in a CT scan. Take a look at this. This is one of my residents. This patient uh, loses this distal tooth. Obviously, now we are planning implants. The patient's going to need a sinus grafting procedure. And when we look at this periapical film, we see a clearly demarcated route of this artery. So the first thing we did is we took this periapical film to our radiologist, maxillofacial radiologist, highly qualified. He's dual boarded in oral pathology and radiology. And he said, you know what? This looks like the, the PSA. Then we took a scan. And yes, exactly where we saw this is where we see the canal in the lateral wall. So today, when we are doing sinus grafting, obviously, you know, we always take a cone beam CT, but an astute clinician should be able to pick this up even on periapical because the incidence, and that's a next paper coming out, like I said, is about 25 to 30 percent. So now we were better prepared, and as you can see, that's our artery. It's going to be right where our window is. So we use piezos, which we know are very, very safe. Once we've do done that, we've dissected that artery, and you can see this artery takes a vertical course, and this is as big as my pinky here. This is a big, major artery. But once we have this retracted, then it's business as usual. We reflect all the way up to the medial wall. We put a collagen membrane. We pack our bone graft, and we place our implants, uh, or not, depending on how much residual height you had. So again, the artery is not a major problem but being aware of it is what's important. Now, how do we prevent bleeding? For example, this is a periapical film, and that's our artery. So knowledge, knowing that you could spot this, looking for it, is important. And that's um, the clinical picture of the artery that we see in the periapical film. So first is, like I said, obtain a cone beam CT, know exactly where that vessel is. Number two. We use some fiber optic lights, or if you use a, a headlight, please use that. Shine it at different angles. You'll be able to spot this artery running through the lateral wall. That's important. And obviously, avoid. If you can go below it, like we did here, great. If not, using piezos or, for example, the, the SLA burr or the DASC burr minimizes the risk of tearing the artery. So that's how we prevent any intraoperative bleeding, serious bleeding.
What happens if you hit the artery? Number one, obviously don't panic. I always keep extra pair of shorts in my office. Always helps. Direct pressure. Anytime you have bleeding from bone, just seven to 10 minutes. Uh, we control the hemostasis sometimes with one is to 50 epi. Bone wax has been helpful. Or you have a window, and if it's really hemorrhaging, take your hemostats, put one end of it inside the sinus, one over the bone, and just crush the bone channel and uh, ligate the artery till you can tie it off. Uh, and we do not recommend using electrocautery or lasers because this is a major vessel. That can cause more damage and more hemorrhaging. So please avoid using a laser or an electrocautery. Third, implant displacement, intraoperative complication. For example, this was in the news. This is out of a newspaper on the web, and this was made into a big deal. Patient went in to get an implant from their dentist, and the implant ends up in the nose. Well, you can only imagine what happened here. The implant got uh, displaced in the sinus, and where is the body going to reject that implant? It thinks it's an allergen through the ostium. That's your implant, which was then retrieved by an ENT surgeon, but this became a big deal. And as we look in the literature, there are few cases of implants migrating. Now, this can happen intraoperatively, or it can happen a few days, a few weeks later. Uh, but, for example, this one is upside down on the second floor. So, how do we avoid this? I wanted to share this case with you, because when you have a sinus that dips like this, you have to be very, very careful, because when we are doing an implant placement, this very thin um, sinus floor, and especially in these pneumatized sinuses, because of that thin bone, you could push that implant right in. So this happened actually uh, just a couple of months back with one of my residents, so I wanted to share this with you. So she wants to do an immediate implant. Everything's planned, everything is good. She places the implant, everything is great, and then I hear a lot of commotion. So I said, what happened? She said, we've lost the implant. I said, what do you mean we've lost the implant? So we are looking on the floor, we are looking on the surgical tray. I, where did the implant go? So I said, okay, let's take an x-ray. We took an x-ray, there's your implant. She removes the fixture mount. As she goes in to put the cover screw, probably just torqued it a little bit, and because of no apical resistance, the implant goes up. So I have her use a gutta percha to mark. She's never done this before. I said, this is your time to learn, and we'll open up a window, a Cadwell Luck window, and we'll retrieve the implant. So she opens up the window, and I said, look, this is too small. Open it up a little bit bigger so that you can grab this implant, because the very fact that it's gone in, chances are there's probably a perforation of the membrane. So she's using hand instruments. I said, don't use hand instruments. We'll be sitting here till tomorrow. Use some rotary instruments or some piezo to widen that window. So as she does that, I hear another. And she says, Dr. Bola, we've lost the implant. I said, again? What do you mean you've lost the implant again? So I go in and I see there is no implant. Where did that implant go? Well, we take an x-ray, and the implant's not now migrated towards the distal. Lesson we've learned is because right there and then gravity will move, don't move your patient, don't have them lean back and then sit up again, that implant's going to migrate in the sinus because there's a breach of that Schneiderian membrane. Anyway, we opened up this window, we retrieved the implant, we got it out, and then the next question is, we now have a big perforation, so how do we manage that? We'll talk about that right after this. I'll spend maybe five seconds talking about infection, um, but that's not the focus. Like I said, Augmentin is our first drug of choice anytime there's a sinus infection. Uh, if patients are allergic to penicillin, we give them azithromycin or Avalox. We put them on decongestants uh, with antihistamine and decongestants. Prednisone, if the infection is getting to be overwhelming, uh, in a tapering dose. And ENT consultation, if those symptoms do not improve. So I won't spend too much time on the infection because um, I need to cover a little bit more here. And then sometimes we have to remove that infected graft. But let's talk about oroantral communication. For example, 
What if it happens when you're retrieving an implant or you have a large perforation? What do we do today? There are different ways. We used to do a pedicle flap. Uh, we used to use, move some connective tissue over. Today, we have biomaterials that we can use. For example, this is a publication on HIV AIDS patients. We have 3,000 HIV and AIDS patients in Detroit. Uh, some of these were diagnosed with HIV, being HIV positive back in the 80s. They've had full-blown AIDS, and the medicines work great. They're leading healthy lives. So as you can see here, this was an implant that was retrieved, uh, an infected tooth that was removed, and we have a huge oroantral communication. That's what it looks like clinically. That was a big piece of granulation tissue um, in a cyst-like form. We remove this, and now we have a huge big oroantral communication, and there is no sinus lining here. So we use a resorbable collagen barrier. This is a thicker barrier that takes about four to six months to resorb. Uh, we seal it, and we let it heal. Six months later, what appears in a radiograph appears to be actual bone gain. So we look at the cone beam CT, and exactly because we had a vertical component on the palatal aspect, and this prevented the epithelium from growing in, we had a blood clot, and guess what? We now have bone where we had none. No bone graft was placed. It was just sealed with this uh, long, resorbing collagen membrane. And we have not only the closure, but we have gain in bone height as well, where we could go in and place our implant. So we know that if we can maintain the blood clot in the sinus, it's the most predictable place to grow bone. You know, it's like an extraction socket. It's well contained, but the problem is, how do you keep that bone the blood clot from staying contained? So, for example, when we have large perforations, uh, there's a classification of these sinus perforations, and this is a class five perforation. What are our choices, really? We know that 10% of these perforations fall into this category, where they're really big, and they're difficult to repair. And most of the times, clinicians have aborted the procedure. So we can either seal the sinus with large collagen membranes. Dr. Picos um, does a great job. He'll tack some collagen membranes, fold them in. That's an option. We can do a block graft. That's an option. We can abort the procedure. This is pretty much what's done most of the time or go with conventional removable prosthesis. Now, when we started looking at this concept that if we can keep the blood clot contained in the sinus, we know it's going to grow bone, we went back and looked at the literature. And we looked at sinuses where implants were placed. The implants were used as a tenting screw, but no bone graft was placed. And guess what? Implant survival was 100% because your, tent, your implant acting as a tenting screw kept the membrane lifted up, and everything around the implant, the blood clot stayed, and it grew bone. And that's exactly what was reported, that the maintenance of a blood clot alone was key in the success. So we said, let's think outside the box here, right? And we said, could we place a trabecular metal implant in, because it has this three-dimensional osteoconductive surface uh, in a non-graftable sinus. We didn't know. Second was, could this osteoconductive material design, macro design, help stabilize the blood clot? We, we did not know what the answer is, but it was a hypothesis. And how appropriate that our meeting here talks about today's innovations maybe tomorrow's solutions. So it's so apt what our thinking was. When we look at the literature, we know that implants today are roughened because by altering the physical and chemical properties, we get more bone to implant contact and we get faster healing. But the problem really is no matter how much we roughen a surface, we never get 100% bone to implant contact, which is fine. We don't need 100% because any rough surface implant today has more bone-to-implant contact than machine titanium. But the question is, can this help us 
when we have poor bone quality, or in our case, we wanted to see what could this do in the sinuses. So how do we overcome this challenge? Well, the only way was to create a three-dimensional implant structure. It cannot be done with titanium. So trabecular metal is tantalum. It's 73 on the periodic table. And a lot of folks don't realize that Dr. Branamark's early studies were all done on tantalum. It was just, it was difficult to cast, and it was very expensive that they switched to titanium. So this has been used in orthopedics for over 15 years, 20 years now. This is a hip Im implant. And what we've seen in the orthopedic literature is this controlled osteoconductive nature that allows for bone to grow in in a controlled fashion. And this has now been adopted for the past three or four years um, into the implant. It's still a titanium implant, has a central core of this tantalum. This is the proof of principle study. Someone quoted Dr. Markus Schlee in Germany. He did this proof of principle study where they were loading these implants immediately because of that mechanical interlock. This is some of the research. Now we have three-year data. The most important thing is zero failures in type 4 bone. This is a continuation of the proof of principle study. And now we have human histology that shows this bone in growth in a very controlled fashion. So given the science, given the problem that we have, that most of these are non-repairable sinus linings, we wanted to test this implant. This was among the first cases that we did. Just to see, for example, there's an oroantral communication. It's going to be an immediate implant, uh, but we are not going to push a bone graft because you don't want that bone graft going into the sinus. So we place this trabecular metal implant in, we get good primary stability, and we let it heal. No grafting was done. Agreed. In this, only a little bit of that implant was in the sinus, but these were our initial cases. Six weeks, we used reverse torque tests of 35 Newton centimeter. The implant did not move. And when we took a CT off the site, we see not just on growth, but blocks of bone growing right into the mid portion of the implant. So this was encouraging. And this is two years now post-loading. We just got this clinical photo, had the patient come in last week. So we were doing a lot of immediate placements, but then we said, let's push the envelope. This is a nurse who's had six previous sinus surgeries because from ENT surgeons because of allergies. So they've gone in, they've curated the lining, and there really isn't much lining, very thin. So our hypothesis again was, can we place this implant in a bare sinus, no bone graft, we create a lot of bleeding, and can that trabecular metal, the central portion that's osteoconductive, help maintain the blood clot? Because if the blood clot stays, it will grow bone. That's our hypothesis. We didn't know when we did this. So we place our implant, and we let it heal for four months. Four months. Remember, mind you, this is only 3.3 millimeters of residual height here. The rest of the implant is in bare naked sinus. We do reverse torque tests, 35 Newton centimeter, and then we took scans of that implant. And when we zoom in, this was among our first proof of principle case where we see a block of bone jumping from the lateral wall almost one to one and a half centimeters growing right into the mid portion of the implant. And this now is a two year follow up of this implant post loading. So this was encouraging. We had to do more. Again, this happens to be uh, a big oroantral communication. Obviously we cannot push the bone graft in. We seal it with a collagen membrane and we have only the palatal wall to give us stability for this implant, and we bury that implant for four months. Four months later, our scan shows exactly what we saw in the previous patient, not just on growth, but this entire block of bone growing right into the mid portion of the implant. Now, this is still in provisionals. This has been over a year post-loading. Here's another, and this, by the way, is, is being published. As you can see, a big oroantral communication. We had very little bone on the palatal aspect. 
we could not repair the sinus lining, so we place this trabecular metal implant in, we bury this, and what do we see? Four months later, we see that entire block of bone, like a vortex of bone growing right into the mid portion of the implant. In fact, we see some from the medial wall jumping because the blood clot stays. That's the key, is for that blood clot to stay. And I think that's where the trabecular three-dimensional design helps keep that blood clot. This is one and a half years post-loading. This is heavy occlusion. You can see some of that porcelain is chipped. We look at the x-ray and we see that, that block of bone again, what we saw in the CT scan, growing right into that mid portion of the implant. So we have this case series. It's encouraging. And not only have we gained height, but something interesting is we looked at the bone density, Hounsfeld units. Some of these are off the charts. That, that block of bone that's there is very, very dense, extremely dense. So this is encouraging. But please remember, these are proof of principle cases only. We've done this just to demonstrate a hypothesis that if we can keep the blood clot contained because of this macro design of the implant, we might actually get some ingrowth. This is the first time it's been shown in the dental literature. This is not a routine treatment recommendation, by all means. But what this does for me is, today, myself, a lot of my colleagues are doing sinus bumps with this implant, with not grafting. Uh, at the same time, when we place this in poor bone quality, at least it's a vote of confidence that we are getting some ingrowth. We need to do controlled clinical trials before this can be a routine uh, recommendation. But again, I think it's important for us to look at technology. I'm from Detroit. We make a few cars in Detroit. And I say, technology is great. Cars are so much safer. You know, you start drifting, they wake you up. They have sensors. But we need to be the good driver. We need to be the good clinician. And we need to use technology to our advantage. So with that, in conclusion, we looked at intraoperative complications, membrane perforation, artery bleeding, implant displacement in the sinus. We looked at some postoperative complications. So again, I'll repeat myself. We learn from our failures, not from our successes. Successes make us happy. Our failures keep us real. So my focus was what we have learned, how can we minimize and avoid this, and what the future might hold in some of these challenging clinical situations where we have either a non-repairable or a non-existent sinus lining. With that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, this is a good friend and mentor of mine, Dr. Michael Sonic. He'll be speaking here tomorrow. We've done a lot of cadaver courses together, and we had a lot of international uh, dentists that came to attend this cadaver course. This was in Celebration, Florida. With, with that, I'd like to say thank you to Dental XP. Uh, this is my first time here speaking. It's been a great honor, and, and I look forward to the next two days of learning. Um, thank you very much.